Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live this evening. A prophetic look at what's happening inside of Syria. The mystery uh, behind the S-300, S-400 system. Why didn't it work? Why didn't it take out the Tomahawk missiles? And yet again, Russia claiming they did not even engage the Tomahawk missiles. And some reports coming out of Russia, others saying that the uh, S-300 system, S-400 system couldn't take down the Tomahawk missiles. And yet at the same time, Russia is questioning uh, the United States' effectiveness, uh, stating that only 23 of the Tomahawk cruise missiles actually hit the target there and questioning what happened to the rest of the Tomahawk missiles that were fired. That's something very unusual because in all the other engagements the United States has done in a war combat such as Iraq, etc., there is well over a 95% uh, success rate in, in those Tomahawk missiles uh, going in and hitting their targets. It's very unusual for one of those missiles not to make its target. Now, the United States did admit that one of the missiles did not reach the target, but yet we're getting conflicting reports that only 23 made their target. Makes me wonder whether or not Russia is really telling uh, all the truth about this, whether or not, whether it be Syria or Russia, one that may have tried to knock down some of these missiles and was successful, but not fully successful. And that's something that Russia wouldn't want to look bad upon as far as the uh, S-300 system. That's just kind of a take I have on that. But we're going to be looking at something prophetic here, something I shared with you guys months and months ago about about the S-300 system and whether or not was it prophetically spoken of in the Bible. And I shared that with you that it was, is in the book of Zephaniah. And we may be finding that, well, maybe that prophecy is actually starting to play out. I want to share those things with you here in just a moment here. Before we do, let's look at a couple of things that are going on this breaking since then. Russian Foreign Minister and uh, 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 Lavrov and Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson talked on the phone today, Lavrov clearly say, stating that there needs to be an investigation done. There was no chemical weapons, demanding that the U.S. actually put some uh, experts on the ground, even at the air base there, to prove that there is no chemical weapons that Syria has and clearly stating that the United States did it intentionally. Now don't forget, we actually shared with you guys, even before the chemical attack on, uh, that happened on the 4th of April, but on the 3rd of April, we were telling you here on Israeli News Live, the United States was getting ready to strike Syria. Now I've been thinking it was gonna be Damascus, but before they can take out Damascus, you gotta take out the uh, aerial campaign. That's what the US did in Iraq. It's what they're doing in Syria as well, taking out Syria's air force. Something else is gonna be kind of alarming to you. Uh, one of the reasons too, we didn't see Russia really get engaged over protecting Syria from these uh, Tomahawk missiles coming in is because Russia has a policy of not engaging a third party country that is trying to overtake uh, the Syrian government. And according to one of the articles that I read in the Russian language there, they said they will not uh, have that type of agreement with them either. So it's very concerning to me as I'm watching the events unfold there, knowing that uh, President Putin is willing to take down ISIS and all the other terrorist groups that are fighting against Bashar al-Assad, but then is not willing to stand up against the United States in this type of a situation. At the same time, though, Peskov, the uh, uh, a spokesman for, for Russia, a military spokesman there, he is stating that this has really put a, a very dangerous situation for, for Russia and the United States. And even we're finding from Medvedev, who, who wrote on his Facebook page today, that this was, that raises the, uh, the, the heightened tensions between Russia and the United States. So clearly there is a major tension between the two, but of course, whether or not Russia is going to stand by Bashar al-Assad when a ground invasion starts by the United States and possibly Israel still remains to be seen. All right, so now let's take another look at here. We shared with you also President Erdogan of Turkey. How many times have I stated that that was nothing but a fake coup year, uh, not years ago, but a, what, I guess getting close to about a year ago now. Uh, it was a fake coup from the very beginning. It was Erdogan was using it. He was working with the United States 
in order to get in the good graces of Russia, only to be able to move in a military contingent in the north part of the country, so that when they're ready to take down President Bashar al-Assad, that they would have Turkey on the northern side, Israel on the southwest side, United States entering in through Lebanon from the west, and even from Jordan to the south, Saudis made no doubt may get involved in this war as well to take down Bashar al-Assad. And it seems like Trump is a guy that's going to do it. Whether or not he's getting bad intel because CIA is setting up things intentionally to make it look like that uh, President Bashar al-Assad is this kind of a wicked evil demon or not, I don't know the answer to that, but clearly Trump is definitely authorizing it based on the intel that he's being given. But again, as I stated all along, Erdogan, this was all a setup. Now maybe Russia believes it. Uh, I've, I've stated it as well to Putin that you need to know that this man is only going to stab you in the back later. Erdogan welcomes U.S. missile strikes on Syrian air base, says it's not enough. Well, so much for standing alongside of President Putin there to be a friend of Bashar al-Assad. No, well, there's a knife going right in Putin's back. So now Putin is seeing not only uh, Erdogan, but an entire world applauding the actions of President Trump on Syria and also the taking down of Bashar al-Assad out of power. Now, <laughs> I won't be getting into it tonight, but you want to talk about putting the hooks plural in the jaws and bringing them down uh, to, to this part of the world, you're starting to see uh, the Gog and Magog set itself in motion. But that's not the prophecy we're going to be looking at tonight. Before I go there, though, I want to look at a, uh, one other thing here, real, or two things real quick with you. One, as I stated the other day, if uh, the United States were to attack uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad, I did believe that Bashar al-Assad would actually retaliate on Israel. And that's exactly what came out today. Breaking Assad regime via Russian mediator says any future strikes by the U.S. will result in Scud missile attacks on Israel. Well, Mr. Assad, I hate to tell you this, but you've just given them all the more reason to want to go ahead and take you down out of power. And I know that uh, Bashar al-Assad, I... I Really appreciate his stand for the Christian community inside of Syria. He's always been a, a, a strong advocate for the, for the Christian people. Uh, very much a state like that of Israel, uh, who has freedom of religion in their country, uh, including that of the, of the Christian people. And I might just remind some of you, those that are listening, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24 there, Jesus speaks about, uh, or it speaks about how the fame of Jesus went all through Syria. Some of the very first churches that ever existed were in Syria. Remember Paul, he was going down there to destroy the Christians in Damascus. He was on his road to Damascus there. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, very strong early Christian uh, roots there inside of Syria. So my Christian friends that are watching tonight, just want to remind you of that. This is where some of the earliest Christians were at was inside of Syria there. Uh, so it's very, very sad indeed to see the things that are happening. But let's take a quick look now. Uh, well, before I go into Zaphaniah, let's quickly look over here. This is a Russian language article here from uh, svpressa.ru. Uh, it's on War 21, Article 169994, just for your information there. And this is dealing with the Russian S-300, S-400 system, and why did they not take down these missiles? But again, I believe that there, that there was an attempt. And I say that because 29, I think it's 29 or so missiles never made it to the target, or 26, I believe it was, never made it in. Uh, so there's a lot of question as to why they didn't make it. And uh, because it didn't take them all down, no doubt if Russia did try to engage or if Syria tried to use the S-300 system against there, they're just not wanting to admit uh, the, the, the low profile of it. But anyway, uh, we're going to go back to that in a moment because of the prophecies on this. But here's what's interesting. Don't forget, uh, before I go into this article here as well, remember in Greece, they've just got through doing a bunch of exercises over there, including the United States, Greece, uh, Syria, I'm not, I'm not serious, sorry, Israel and uh, the United Arab Emirates and Italy all were practicing how to overcome the S-300 system. Well, the United States no doubt figured that out and it's flying the tomahawks at low altitude. 
Uh, now this is going to probably throw a few of the people that are flat earth believers right off the track here because they make a very interesting comment here about the earth on this. It says our S-400 air defense system deployed in Syria at the Khamenei Air Base could not technically knock down the American Tomahawks, said the Colonel of Reserve member of the Expert Council of the Board of the Military Industrial Commission of the Russian Federation, Viktor Marakovsky. Before the Syrian air base, Shariat on which the Americans stacked from Khamenei about 100 kilometers. However, for air defense systems there, a restrictive concept of a radio horizon. In other words, the horizon itself is what played a key factor in the S-300, S-400 systems not detecting the movement of these missiles. Yes, the maximum range of the S-400 is 400 kilometers. But we must understand it is reachable by air targets which operate at medium and high altitudes. Cruise missiles that operate at altitudes of 30 to 50 meters are not visible from such a distance. All right, simply because the Earth is curved, sphere spherical, in a word, the American Tomahawks were outside the S 400 radio horizon. In other words, because they only go that high up before they start heading into their target, running right across the surface of the Earth, and the, given the fact, as they're pointing out here, the curvature of the Earth there, they did not detect them as they came up. And they're not really designed to knock out low altitudes. Now, Russia supposedly does have an air defense system that will knock out the low altitude tomahawks, but that's not deployed inside of Syria. But isn't it funny, there's been so much touting that the Russian S-300, S-400 systems could knock down anything, including the Tomahawk cruise missiles. But I guess the U.S. figured out the best way to do it is run it at low altitude in order to avoid detection. So I guess if they can avoid detection, so can planes. So keeping this right here in mind. So I thought that was very interesting. And in, in light of that, let's jump over to Zaphaniah. Now, I want to bring out a couple of verses here as we go into Zephaniah specifically because it also sets the time frame of what's going on. So if you look at Zephaniah chapter 2, we go into verse 2 and verse 3, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So for those of you that look for what is called a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, I actually look at this more so, not so much as far as tribulation, but as that there is a hiding away for those that are meek, those that seek righteousness, doing that which is right. In other words, keeping the commandments of God. You could actually be hidden away while God's wrath is poured out on the earth. All right. So just hold that in mind right there. Now watch what happens. For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon, a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the uh, Ch uh, Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy you, that there shall be no more inhabitants. At the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. Interesting. Watch what he says, verse 7. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Now that is fascinating in itself right there. Verse 7. Do you realize this is talking about modern day Israel, talking about that they're there on the coastline and that the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. In other words, they're going to recognize their Messiah. But if you notice, there's no mention of Jerusalem. 
Now Micah does speak about Israel returning and going to Mount Zion, but then Micah also goes a little further and talks about how that they would be in travail and they would be taken out of, of, of Jerusalem and dwell in the fields. Why is it that we see that Israel is just on a coastline though? That's pretty much what a two-state solution would end up looking like putting Israel on the coastline of the very land that they've returned home to. Isn't that interesting? God's showing you that the coastline is where the house of Judah will end up dwelling. And as we move towards this so-called peace agreement or a two-state solution, we are going to find that Micah's prophecy, chapter 4, where it speaks about that Israel returns home even to Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem forevermore. But then God says, why are you in travail? He says, you shall be taken out. Let me, let me just quickly take you to that. I think it's very important we kind of throw that in there because it does show that Israel goes in. It does show that Israel would be in Jerusalem. But a strange thing happens that drives the children of Israel out of Jerusalem, right? Chapter 4. It shall come to pass that the mount of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. And many nations shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay? He shall judge between many peoples, right? We get all this right here. But then what happens? Then something changes. See? Verse 7, And I will make her that is halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a mighty nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in, uh, in, over them in Mount Zion from hence, thenceforth even forever. And thou Migdal, El Eder, the hill of daughter of Zion, unto the, into thee shall it come, yea, the former dominion shall come, and the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee, as thy counselor perished? Pains have taken hold of you as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shall you go forth out of the city, and shall dwell in the field, and shall come even to Babylon. There shall you be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Babylon, your enemy. And now many nations are assembled against you to say, let her be defiled let, uh, and let our eye gaze upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand his counsel. For he hath gathered them as the sheaves to the threshing floor. So yes, we do go out and we do dwell in the fields. Well, the fields are definitely not in the mountains of around Jerusalem, but getting down to Moedin, uh, down, down there off of Highway 1, and of course, going all the way over to Ashkelon, just uh, that's just south of, or excuse me, yeah, south of Tel Aviv. All right. So again, putting us all in the coastal plains. That's exactly what the two-state solution was going to do. Make Jerusalem an international city. The West Bank uh, would be totally under Palestinian control, and that leaves only coastlines other than down by the Sinai Peninsula for the House of Judah. Interesting, isn't it? So. Here's what gets more interesting, though. Let's drop all the way down now to verse 12, because it's all setting up a time frame. Yea, Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by the sword. Ethiopians are going through a pretty hard time right now, all over because Rome wants the oil, right? And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation dry like a wilderness. And the flock shall lie down in the midst of her, and the beasts of the nations, both the corm cormorant and the bitter, shall lodge in the upper inlet, uh, lentils of it, and their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. All right? Notice so. Nineveh, by the way, is right there in the ancient city of Mosul. Excuse me, the ancient city of Nineveh is in Mosul, uh, which is northwest Iraq. Assyria, the ancient, uh, ancient country of Assyria, literally encompasses 
northwest Iraq, and all of modern-day Syria. Isn't it interesting that it speaks here in verse 13, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation. What I find interesting is that he, the same person or same country, destroys both Nineveh and Assyria. That's the United States. The United States is the one that has taken down Mosul, with Iraq, of course. And the United States has played a major role in trying to topple Bashar al-Assad from the very, very beginning. Under Obama, under his hand, trying to bring in all these rebel fighters and different ISIS fighters from around the world there to topple Bashar al-Assad in a six-year-long civil war. And now, President Trump is continuing the same battle. As I said before, it's not to say that it won't happen. Prophecy will definitely be fulfilled, but what I find is interesting it says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation dry like a wilderness. What's next to come? Definitely some type of ground invasion. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen this week or next week. But you can count on one thing. The United States is getting ready. The entire world has rallied around President Trump to do exactly that. I don't believe that President Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons on his own people. I believe that was done by the rebels. But it doesn't matter what I believe. They're going to do it anyway. And many more innocent civilians will die. Not that they're not already dying through all the different airstrikes that are being done, including by Syria and including by Russia, including by the United States, including by Turkey, etc., the death, the loss of life is unbelievable. Nahum prophesied of Mosul and how ungodly of an attack, attack that would be. Even Micah speaks about it as well. Assyria becoming desolate because of an internal strife. All these things, all of these things mounting up, prophecy fulfilling like never before. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Uh, don't forget, check out uh, Yana's channel, Rise Up Children of God. Yana had today Sherry Timpany on, the uh, famed um, doctor that is really trying to educate the people about the dangers of vaccines, something you'll want to listen to there. It'll be airing here on Israeli News Live uh, here soon as well, but uh, today it's already up on her channel. I'm Stephen Benoon. If you're watching Israeli News Live, we'll leave a link in the description below so you can check out that interview. Shalom.